I'm Kat Powers, and today we're talking with Chris Dewan. After the unexpected removal of dozens of mature trees from Beacon Street in 2017, my guest Chris Dewan started attending city meetings, filling Freedom of Information requests, and sharing his observations on Twitter as Summershade One. Today he is co-chair of the Somerville Urban Forestry Committee. He is active in several local advocacy groups, including Somerville's Alliance for Safe Streets and Green and Open Somerville. He works remotely for a Connecticut-based company. He is a gardener and, as we've just heard, an amazing cellist. You have a very, very weird hobby for which we are all quite grateful. Why, why summer shade? So summer shade, and, and I want to start off and say the hobby, while it is not a common one, it's also totally not unique. There are, even just within Somerville, there are at least half a dozen other people who make a habit of attending various city meetings and posting the proceedings, grabbing screen grabs, and sharing it out with the, the world on Twitter. I suspect there are people who do the same thing on Facebook or on other social media sites. And as I realized that this was a hobby I was enjoying, I, did, I was curious how odd it was. And so if you look at any city, any region, you will find some folks who make it their business to pay attention to government and share out what they see as broadly as they can. Folks do it in different ways, but um, it is an odd but not a unique hobby is what I would say. We're all grateful for it. Uh, I thought I was following you on Twitter uh, because every time I was looking for Somerville News, there you were. Uh, I've just discovered I wasn't following you on Twitter. I've since corrected that problem. But uh, where did, why Summer Shade? Okay, so Summer Shade, as you know, we have a habit in the city of naming things summer whatever mm -hmm. or being whateverville. Mm -hmm. And um, I found that I have a friend who is a, a linguistic anthropologist and she noticed this practice and referred to it as neo-Soviet. <laughs> okay. And, and that kind of stuck with me. And so I wanted to poke a little bit at being the summer whatever. Mm -hmm. And when I started the, the account, as you mentioned, I was furious that they had cut down all the mature trees. I didn't know who they were at that time or how that could have happened. And so the intention was to, you know, honestly throw a little shade, mm -hmm. you know. Um, since then, I've, I've settled out. I'm no longer doing it because I'm angry at all. It's fascinating to how much you are allowed to see, how much you're allowed to know, and how impactful even one person's voice can be if you just keep showing up. It's been a really positive thing over time. Do you pick particular meetings that you're going to tweet out? I do. And what I learned following the saga of the trees was that there's a thread that if you pull it, it goes through most of the meetings, right? And you can start just about anywhere. You know, you go to the city council. The city council meetings are a great place to start. That, that's, I try to attend those regularly. Mm -hmm. and. What you'll see is that items are sorted to committee meetings, so things that relate to legislation go to legislative matters. Things that relate to our open spaces uh, might go to you know, the open space committee. Things that relate to how the council itself works go to rules. And if you have a particularly good issue, uh, and I believe firmly that they're, like simple problems are already solved, if it were really as simple as a tweet, well, we'd have solved that already. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to follow it through and see, okay, how does that impact the staff? How does that impact the legislative aspects? How does it impact finance? You know, can we even talk about this without going to the state government to ask permission? You know, and you find yourself pulling this thread through the city. And so I'll grab onto something that I want to follow and trace it along wherever it goes. What usually catches your attention? The things that catch my attention are when people don't know what's going on, and I'm talking about like city councilors here and senior city staff, when it's obvious that we don't know what's going on, there's a lack of transparency, or there's a lack of accountability. Something happens and it's big and impactful, but there's the, the not my job zone. Mm -hmm. That's a place where if you dig in, you'll often find there's a gap in our laws, there's a gap in our practice, there's a gap in our staffing. and Digging through those tend to be the interesting conversations. 
The ones that are less interesting are the ones that start, well, we do this every year, and we kind of have to decide whether it's 0.5% or 1%. Mm -hmm. That's going to work itself out. <laughs> hmm. Are there, have you seen your tweets make an impact? I have. It's been surprising. I've gotten more careful with my speech over the past three, mm. four, five years, where um, people's voices really do matter, and it's shocking how few people engage closely with city matters. When you look at a particular issue, if you want to get the city council's attention, a petition with a dozen names on it is impactful. And I have more than a dozen followers now. Mm -hmm. And so the thing that I have, the thing I would like to avoid is to rouse ire and anger and have people yelling at potentially the wrong folks. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think that merely yelling at people does any good. And so that's, that's a negative sort of impact. I, I don't know how much of it was the tweeting, how much of it was the engaging and working and the sort of more direct activism, talking with staff, talking with legislators. But we have improved, I think, the city in the few years that I've been watching. And I like to think that I've helped. <laughs> this is a very, very different time where Twitter has an impact, where perhaps these cameras had an impact before, or uh, just a newspaper. I know, you know, back in back in the day when I was at a newspaper, just our presence at a meeting, and and the counselors could literally see me sitting in in the crowd with you know two or three other people. We would make a difference that way. Mm -hmm. How is it uh, where? You know, we're in this weird period where instead of in-person meetings, we're in Zoom. Can, do the counselors know you're there? Uh, they absolutely do. Um, and there is a back channel of tweets and liking of tweets and occasional direct messages and text messages mm -hmm. that you know happens in all meetings. Mm -hmm. You know, and you were there in the councils when that was, um, when, in the before times. In the before times, we called yeah. them aldermen. Yes, exactly. In, 2017, 2018, when I started attending city council meetings or the board of aldermen meetings, um, they absolutely knew I was there. And people started to know that I was listening and they would perhaps get an email the next day. They would perhaps hear from people that I talked with the next day. Mm -hmm. And that sort of engagement and intention absolutely does continue. The panelists, and, the panelists in these online meetings can see the names that you put in. It's possible to do it pseudonymously or mm -hmm. anonymously, which is a really, really good thing in government. I think that that's an important facet that has, it's an improvement that's come out. It's, a it's now possible to attend one of these public meetings and not have to share your real name or your face, mm -hmm. which is really empowering for a lot of people. It also leads to some bad behaviors, but we can talk about that later. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm sure you've been called a Twitter troll or um, accused of having a motivation behind all of this. Mm -hmm. Um, does having a, a public, having your name publicly out there, does that change that perception? I don't know that it changes the perception, but it keeps me honest. Okay. Um, the, so, so Twitter is a cesspit. Let's just start there. Yep. And social media as a whole, like the algorithm, its job is to keep you convinced of your own rightness hmm. and spike in just enough that you stay mad and engaged. Hmm. Right? And that's what we're all reading in our feeds, yeah. is a whole bunch of people who agree with us and some that'll make us angry. Mm -hmm. you know? um, when you have a place where you can combine a large audience with anonymity and you're rewarded for attention, mm -hmm. very, very naturally you get these maladaptive behaviors. Right? Um, I find that putting my own name on my account does keep me honest. I run into people in the street. I run into people in the grocery store. Mm -hmm. you know? um, and uh, I honestly haven't had too many people really call me out for negativity. I mean, it certainly happens. The thing that happens more than that is I'll get called out by friends, fellow activists, neighbors, when I say something that's just incorrect or just turns out to be rude or poorly phrased. Yeah. And dealing with that without putting too much on it, you know, an appropriate, honest, rapid apology and improved behavior, um, 
if you lean into the feedback you get from your friends in the radically public social media circle, it can improve your behavior quickly. Yeah, there is nothing that would curb my behavior when I was in news, other than you know somebody walking up to me when I was in line at Market Basket. Mm -hmm. Honestly, that was that would shut me down <laughs> faster than a call from the mayor's office. Absolutely. <laughs> so. Um, Going back to the whole uh, summer shade and trees. So um, let's talk about the tree protection ordinance. What was the process that, what was your involvement in that? So when in late 2017, Somerville's laws related to trees were a mishmash of things that we had put in place over the past couple of decades to clearly state our support for state law. There are a lot of ordinances on the books that just say, we obey this state law, mm -hmm. you know. And then there were others that expanded. For example, the state law on trees um, pertains only to uh, public shade trees, which are along the, uh, the public rights of way. Right. We the had a, trees in the sidewalk, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. Okay. And, and those are governed in large part by the highway department. Uh, and there's a, an attitude, there's a reality that we need to in a very real way be protected from the potential of harm from those trees, limbs falling into mm -hmm. the roadway, whole trees taking down power lines, mm -hmm. right? And um, we had some laws that extended even those limited protections out to the trees in our parks, also on uh, civic land, mm -hmm. but not explicitly governed by state law. Um, as we dug in, once we had attention, so, so the process of popping up, there's only limited attention in the city for any particular thing, yeah. and there's so much more that needs to be talked about than can possibly be talked about. Mm -hmm. And now, this is not a failing of anybody in government. There's just issues, and then humans dealing with issues. There's, if I understand you correctly, that, that's exactly what I mean. That there, you know, to have the city council really get into a complex issue. It takes a, a little over an hour. Sometimes they'll talk for a couple of hours about a particular thing, whether it's surveillance by the government mm -hmm. or you know, the protection of our trees or you know, the appropriate accessibility of our public spaces. Or, you know, and, and some of them are too big even for that. Like mm -hmm. There are issues that we can't solve with any amount of talking. So when I realized that we had this attention on the tree protection. And I looked at the laws and they were inadequate. I, I spoke with my ward counselor and um, with a couple of other folks and said, could we take a run at updating this to do something better? And they said, well, sure. And the usual way that a law gets made in Somerville is that the city council asks the city solicitor to draft something mm -hmm. that they think will work and that the mayor thinks is implementable. And so the city council did that. They said, Mr. Solicitor, please draft an update to this that does X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. And um, there being not enough time in the day, that didn't happen. You know, the city solicitor's very, very busy office and was working on other things. And eventually, um, I asked my ward counselor again, I said, well, what can, what can we do here? He said, well, we could research what other, what other cities do and we could put together a draft. I mean, that doesn't usually happen. Mm -hmm. and, and we started down that road, and that was where we went to these various committee meetings, right, to be sure we understood what was implementable, what was possible. You know, there were concerns that I at first took to be bad faith about the burden on staff that I now know to be absolutely true, that if you have a regulated process, you have to have people to review the applications, to review the spots on the ground, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and so the question of, if we pass this law, are we even going to be able to do it? Because the last thing you want is to pass a law that everybody knows you're never going to enforce. Mm -hmm. right? And as it threaded through, we eventually started getting alignment. It took a huge amount of talking. And then eventually, uh, and back and forth, and stops and starts, but eventually there was this day when I went to a city council meeting, again in public, and this law passed unanimously which at that point was not the thing that I had drafted out based on a couple of other cities. Mm -hmm. It had been written somehow by the city. It was an amazing process to watch, honestly. Mm -hmm. So what, what did this new legislation do? So it did a couple of things. Uh, one thing that it does is makes accountabilities very clear, where we have a role um, called the, the tree warden, mm -hmm. 
and this is a role you have to have in the city um, by under the state law. Mm -hmm. And that historically was a fractional appointment out of the highway division. Um, and the, the highway division employed the tree crew, who were the people with the, uh, the chainsaws and the bucket truck and the chipper, mm -hmm. you know, who take care of the removal of trees. On the other side, there was the responsibility of planting trees, which rests with um, what is now public space and urban forestry. Um, it used to be strategic planning. Um, what the tree protection ordinance created was a clear set of responsibilities that you could go and read who was supposed to do what. It created a tree, um, an urban forestry committee, mm -hmm. which is a group of volunteers and also a member of the public space and urban forestry division, also the tree warden, um, where we come together once a month and talk about these things. You know, and just having a forum where the law says that we're supposed to get together and talk about this once a month can be incredibly empowering. It can also languish, but we've found that to be um, really impactful, actually. The thing that people, as I've talked to folks about tree removal and anything that happens in the city, there's the thing itself. But then there's the feeling that you're under attack, and it's a surprise, and nobody's listening to you. And it's that's that latter that really grinds people, you know, that nobody cares, you know, and, and the person who shows up to actually do the work, you generally didn't make the decision, right? And they're the one you've got to yell at when they come to cut down your tree, which is absolutely the wrong answer, mm -hmm. right? So we created this forum, this, this tree preservation, uh, or this urban forestry committee. We made the roles and accountabilities clear. And then the other thing that we did, and this was, was the thing that took the most talking, was we imposed a regulatory process on the removal of trees from private property. And it was, that was a bit where people were not sure we could do that at the beginning. People said, well, it's private property. It's just like an asset that you own. Why would the city be able to regulate that? And what we based the thinking on was the idea that trees, even though they grow in a particular plot of soil, do provide substantial good to the community around them, right? right? They pull water out of the soil. They actually do reduce flooding substantially. They cool the air by the swamp cooling effect. They provide shade. Uh, they have public health and traffic calming benefits. Lots and lots of studies have shown. So whether the tree is sitting in public land or just over the edge on private land, we all, I think, understand the value of that magnificent tree that shades the whole block. And so we said, something is being lost when a large, healthy, safe tree that is not an invasive species is removed with no consideration of what is being lost. And so we were able to define that. We said, if a tree is hazardous, no problem. If a tree is an invasive species, not talking about that. If it's a very small tree, not talking about that. And we've uh, set up a process where property owners need to apply for a permit to remove these, we called them uh, significant trees. Mm -hmm. And under that permit, if you can point to the trees you're going to plant in replacement and where you're going to put them, no fee. Thank you for just sharing the plan. Mm -hmm. And if it's not that, if it's removal without replacement, then there's a fee structure that is linked to the cost for the city to plant new trees, such that we at least get a couple bucks to plant somewhere else. That was the thing that people told me several times, that we, we absolutely couldn't do, it wasn't going to work, it wasn't going to pass, and, and that's the rule now, and it's worked out fine. That is really hard to get into a tweet. Nuance doesn't fit in tweets. <laughs> and it's, I, I laugh frequently about how I have chosen this medium that absolutely doesn't support nuance. Yeah. <laughs> So do you have a background in news that you've became this, uh, you know, town crier about what's going on um, in, in all of these smaller meetings? No, absolutely not. I'm a computer nerd by training. Yeah. And I, in a couple of different jobs, got to the level in computer nerddom where I would sometimes have to speak to the press. And so they gave me the short form of the media training, mm -hmm. you know. But no, absolutely no communications background. Um, I am fascinated by people. I'm fascinated by how people make decisions and how groups of people make decisions. What does it even mean for a group mm -hmm. to make a decision? You can see it happen. But how does opinion change? And it's 
shockingly sudden when all of a sudden you realize that the whole society has changed its opinion about something. Yeah. Like, but no, I have no formal framing for that, no, no formal training at all. <laughs> Are there things that on Twitter you need to stay away from in Somerville? So I absolutely avoid national politics. Mm. Okay. Um, and not least because you'll say a word that is being monitored by the troll farms, mm -hmm. and then you'll have the whole national army in your, in your mentions, and nobody mm -hmm. actually wants that. Yeah. I, th I think many people think it would be neat to go viral and have a tweet that gets 100,000 people liking it. I, mm -hmm. I really don't want that to happen, mm -hmm. you know? Because here in Somerville, or any city, you know, we actually agree on more than we disagree on. We do, which yeah. is very startling given the number of debates we have in the city. Yeah, but rats are not a partisan issue. The collection of garbage. Well, okay, so... <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll give you that, I'll give you that. But everybody wants their garbage picked up. Mm -hmm. Everybody wants, you know, some communities are just, have uh, places where you drop off your recycling or they pick it up every other week here we agree you pick up recycling every week yeah there are very basic things in the dna here in somerville i don't know if it's the water or the somerville springs or whatever it is but we do actually agree on a number of things so when we do disagree it becomes uh you can see these uh, you can see it online from many you can see it online from space you can see mm -hmm. these flare-ups that happen and yeah. um it is very curious to me that somebody who is of a, you, you are yourself a rather measured person in being, um, that you're, you're engaging in, uh, in, in this, what, what could possibly be a minefield for you? It's, you're exactly right, and I'm thinking about the right way to say it, where there are these debates. Let's mm -hmm. talk about, let's not talk about here because we won't solve it, but the question of how much and what kind of police force do we need? Right. Right? You and I could talk for hours and we wouldn't and settle that. We could walk to the other end of Union Square and find, mm -hmm. you know, 20 different gradations of opinion on that. I totally agree with you. Yeah. So, do you ever weigh in on that particular issue? Uh, the, I try not to directly. Mm -hmm. because it falls very, very frequently into something that Twitter is very, very good at, which is proxy fights, mm -hmm. where we mention a certain term, mm -hmm. and everybody knows what it means when you use that term. You know, the woke police are here to get you, you know. And I find that to be where nuance and, and thoughtful and changing people's minds never happens there. That's where nuance goes to die. Mm -hmm. Like, th there's a saying that I've, I don't know where I picked it up, but I've been saying it for a very long time. No person has ever changed any other person's opinion through an email thread yeah, or a, tw a tweet or whatever. So I try to stay away from the ones where it's just the community reinforcing what they already know to be true. Mm. You know? And that's something that I've learned. If you go back to the 2017 tweets, I was not very skillful about that. You know, I would pile on. And what happens when you start piling on is that the people who you are trying to convince who are adjacent to your thinking, mm -hmm. they just tune out. Yeah. They just absolutely tune out. So, knowing all of this, knowing that uh, we have a very fractured kind of information economy where you can get, you know, you, you, we've got Channel 3 here and the city uh, uh, stations on cable, we've got streaming news, we've got Twitter, we've got Facebook, we've got uh, a few local uh, newspapers with, with smaller subscrip mm -hmm. uh, subscription bases. What is the best way to get the word out about news in Somerville? I think about this a lot because now by hook and crook I have a platform, right? Right. And if you look at just my follower count, it's between one and 2,000 people. Mm -hmm. So that feels like a lot of people to me. That's more than I've ever been in a room with at mm -hmm. one time. And it is a little over 1% of Somerville. So most of Somerville is not following me on Twitter. Mm -hmm. um, when I have done big pushes, the most effective way that I've found is to put some durable piece of information content online. I like Medium posts. You know, Medium's this blogging site. Mm -hmm. um, 
and then point to it from various social media platforms. So not just Twitter, but also Facebook and also Reddit. Um, and what I find, the neat thing about Medium is that you get analytics out of it. You can see where people got to your piece from. Mm -hmm. And so I can tell you that Twitter is small. Uh, Reddit is about the same size as Twitter. Facebook is about twice as big as either it's about as big as Twitter and Reddit put together. Mm -hmm. And direct emails and text messages vastly eclipse all of it. So if you want to get the word out, seed communities and have them send the link to their friends, to their neighborhood list, to their advocacy mm -hmm. list, to their whatever club list they have. That's how you get the word out in Somerville. And that means you cannot just talk to Twitter in terms that Twitter is interested in, mm -hmm. right? That's as, as, as Somebody once, not terribly kindly, said just Twitter talking to itself again. Yeah. You know? But if you want to get the word out, you have to get people interested who then share with their friends, who share with their friends, and mention it to you in the grocery store. Mm -hmm. And yeah, once people are noticing you in the grocery store, you can bet that your city councilors are getting emails, they're getting calls, it's happening in conversation, and then something could actually happen. So I know one of your thing is gardening. Mm -hmm. um, we've got some snow out behind us, but uh, it's, I, I think spring is coming. Mm -hmm. What are you going to plant? So I always do tomatoes. Yeah. I always do peppers. I'm actually totally psyched. This is the weekend that I start my tomatoes and peppers inside. Yeah. Um, I have really enjoyed climbing vines lately. Okay. And because I've got uh, a lot of vertical space where I live, I've got trellises. You know, not not a lot of horizontal space. But you, so you have the Somerville Garden, it's about this big, but we've got all the height. I am fortunate. I spent three years on a waiting list, and I've got a little 8x8 eight eight patch at the Durrell Community Garden. Oh, wow. So that's where the tomatoes and peppers go. Okay. It's got real full sun. Yeah. You know? And where I live, what I've got is space for planters and then vines that grow up and out. Yeah. And so that's where I'm going, all kinds of different climbing things. My goal is to have flowers in bloom for as much of the year as possible. Well, when we put the gardening planters out in front of SMC, we'll have to get your advice on this. Absolutely. But I want to thank you very much for coming uh, down, and I will certainly see you online. Excellent. I will awesome. see you online. Wonderful. So this has been a conversation with Chris Dwan. I'm Kat Powers. We'll see you around.